I open this public session of the Doctoral Examination Committee of the Faculty of Religion and Theology with the votum. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Please be seated. Prior to the examination, I invite the candidate to give a brief explanation of the research on which this thesis is based. The floor is yours. Dear Rector Magnificus, dear audience, John Owen had a multifaceted view of Trinitarian worship that was expressed in several key topics of his theology and was impacted by his eschatological vision. I came to this conclusion over the course of my research by recognizing three key themes in Owen's writings. First, I recognize that the center of Owen's theology of public worship was that it was the highest expression on earth of the believer's communion with the triune God in heaven. Second, I recognize the need to expand out from this center because throughout his ministry, Owen consistently invoked several key theological topics in his discussions of public worship. His theology of worship, therefore, was multifaceted. Third, I recognize that this multifaceted theology could not be explained merely theologically. As historical theological research, I had to recognize that the theology took place within history. This contextual milieu was one of eschatological expectation. And by eschatological, I mean Owen's belief in the coming latter-day glory on earth before the eternal state. Because of this, each topic that he used to express his theology of worship was impacted by eschatology. Returning to my first recognition of the center of Owen's theology of public worship, uh, in sermons from the 15, uh, 1650s, The Nature and Beauty of Gospel Worship, he said this, quote, in the spiritual worship of the gospel, the whole blessed trinity and each person therein distinctly afford distinct communion with themselves unto the souls of the worshipers. And speaking of the spiritual worship of the gospel, Owen used a distinction between the revelation of who God is under the old covenant and under the new. Under the old, the one God's nature as triune was dark and obscure. Under the new, the one God clearly steps into the light as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. More than revealing knowledge of God, Owen pressed this distinction to say a primary advantage of the new covenant believer, a believer is worshiping God as triune in a way that Old Testament saints didn't consciously experience. Returning to my second recognition, expanding out to other key topics of his theology, uh, this thesis examines four, four topics. God's sufficient revelation in scripture, uh, new covenant freedom, the high priestly ministry of Christ, and the work of the Holy Spirit in prayer. The reason for these topics is because Owen set his own agenda for the future trajectory of his theology of worship. In his earliest extant publications as a parish pastor, he especially connected these topics to Trinitarian worship in a simple way. Throughout his life and ministry, he continued to come back to these topics in even deeper ways. And returning to my third recognition, the what of the heart of Owen's theology of public worship and the expansion out to various theological topics leads us to the why. For Owen, public worship was a manifestation of a particular theopolitical eschatology for 17th century England. Let me focus on outlining his eschatological outlook before illustrating its impact on his theology of worship. While in his first parish ministry in 1643, Owen described his early eschatological vision of this gospel age like an hourglass in which the last little grain of sand is about to fall and, quote, time should be no more. He wasn't speaking of an earthly age of latter-day glory, but the end of this earthly age that brings in eternity itself. The last little grain of sand was soon to fall down uh, the hourglass, and the end of human history was imminent. In other words, he had a non-millennial eschatology. He went on to write that more error had crept into the English church uh, from Rome during the previous 16 years than had entered the church in the 100 years before. By 16 years, he meant 1628, when William Laud became Bishop of London. And so in that first country parish, with no millennium to look forward to, with the rise in Romanism, and with a series of years of bad weather, harvests, and famine, Owen sat somewhat frustrated 
and saw the beginning of war in 1642 as a precursor to the end of history. At some point, though, his eschatological vision shifted. He began to look forward to a future golden age, another turn of the hourglass. I suggest that this change reflected his own improved prospects as a disappointed parish pastor in the country. Owen looked for an imminent end to history. Once his toes, though, touched the halls of power as a parliamentary preacher, minister to the new model army and preacher the day after Charles I's regicide, his view shift, uh, shifted. There was a coming age of earthly glory. Throughout his writings, both pre and post 1662, when the monarchy and the episcopacy were reestablished, Owen characterizes this coming age as a fulfillment of several promises. And over the decades of his writings, including after 1662, when he was ejected, he used a consistent list of between two and six promises. Uh, these were summed up in the 1658 Savoy Declaration in a section that was added to the Presbyterian Westminster Confession, and therefore it's a unique section uh, amongst congregational confessions. It says this, quote, according to, the, to his promise, God's promise, we expect that in the latter days, Antichrist being destroyed, the Jews called, the adversaries of the kingdom of his dear son broken, the churches of Christ being enlarged, and so forth, they will have a greater and glory, more glorious condition than they have enjoyed. Uh, the congregational way was part and parcel of the ushering in of the latter day glory. And he saw four apocalyptic events being fulfilled leading to that latter day glory. First, the prophet Jeremiah spoke of the vengeance of the temple. He did use that to describe the destruction on Babylon in retribution for its destruction of Israel. Owen, though, applied it to the party of Archbishop Laud and his outside formal worship, and he also applied it to rigid Presbyterianism. Secondly, he used the imagery of the measuring of the temple in Revelation 11. This meant the full casting out and rejecting of all will worship and abominations and replacement by purity and beauty of ordinances and gospel worship. Third, 2 Peter 3, Revelation 21, the imagery of a new heavens and a new earth. According to Owen, the new heavens and earth was not the eternal state, but a future state of the church in its renewed condition on this earth. This coming age would be a time God would have his tabernacle with men, and that meant for Owen, congregational churches. Fourth, the shaking of the heavens and the earth from Hebrews 12. Owen interpreted not literally of the creation, but metaphorically of the political heights of power in the Civil War. And so unlike Owen's pessimism in his early parish ministry, his eyes had been opened to a new optimism in an age of prophetic fulfillment, citing the prophet Zechariah 12.10, these are the times wherein the spirit of grace and of supplications is promised to be poured out upon the Jerusalem of God. These hopes were dashed by the experience of defeat with Cromwell's death, restoration of the monarchy and episcopacy, and the act of uniformity in 1662. Owen's views again shifted from hope to disappointment. While he experienced defeat, he still had an expectant eschatology. The different historical circumstances, though, changed his focus from the near term to an unknown time. For example, in his 1667 brief instruction in the worship of God, he modified his earlier view that I just mentioned, that the shaking of the heavens and the earth meant political heights to the shaking of the mosaic ordinances in worship. And so pre-1662, his eschatological hope was of a millennial kingdom exemplified in the godly republic. After 1662, it was pushed out into an unknown future that he wouldn't see. So how does all this eschatological vision impact his view of public worship? Back to that first topic, worship according to God's revelation. Owen's pre and post 1662 catechisms taught that the new covenant church was to worship according to whatsoever the Lord hath commanded. After the mid 1640s though, this took on heightened importance. In the latter days, before that coming age of glory on earth, the people of God would return to pure worship via God's revealed will in scripture. Thus, worship by means of strict adherence to God's revelation was a mark of revival in the days leading up to the final age. Back to that second topic, the progressive revelation of history through God's covenants. Since all covenants have worship attached to them, the structure of this covenantal revelation led Owen to compare and contrast God's dealing with his people before and after the coming of Christ. And he did so with a very strong emphasis on discontinuity. In contrast to the liturgical ordinances of the old Mosaic covenants, 
Uh, and the current liturgical impositions of princes and prelates, Owen stated that Jesus brought freedom from both under the new covenant and the church awaited the not yet of a future age of latter-day glory. Back to that third topic of the heavenly priesthood of Jesus Christ in the new covenant. Since God was doing a wonderful work that would reverberate throughout the world in this age awaiting the latter-day glory, the saints would be filled with light and love from the special presence of the exalted Christ who is going to set up his glorious kingdom in the world. Because believers are already united to Christ, the high priest in heaven, outward forms such as prayer books are unnecessary as the church moves towards even greater, uh, an even greater age of latter-day glory to come. Finally, back to that fourth topic, the work of the Holy Spirit in public prayer. Public prayer was a gift to individual ministers from the ascended Christ by his Spirit in the entire gospel age, but especially in the last days before the age of Latter-day Glory Dawn. Thus, theologically, there was no more need for burdens and regulations, such as under the Old Covenant. And politically, there was no more need for impositions like the Act of Uniformity, the Book of Common Prayer. This view challenged the traditionalism of, the, of English Christianity by accentuating the individual minister's spiritual gifting for public prayer. Public prayer was a theological as well as political reality. Owen's views of prayer were directly linked to his eschatology of a glorious age of gospel purity in worship. So to restate in conclusion, John Owen had a multifaceted view of Trinitarian worship that was expressed in several key topics of his theology and was impacted by his eschatological vision. Thank you. May I hear from the candidate that he's prepared to defend his thesis? On your authority and as authorized by the College of Deans and in accordance with the Doctoral Examination Committee and the Faculty of Religion and Theology, I am prepared to defend my thesis entitled, These Are the Days, in order to obtain the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Then we will start the opposition. The opposition will be started by Dr. Crawford Griffin, who is participating online. Dr. Griffin is Associate Professor of History at Queen's University in Belfast. We're delighted to have you in our midst, even virtually, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Candidate, first of all, let me say congratulations uh, on producing such a fine uh, piece of work. On the authority of the rector and by virtue of my rights, I would like to ask you some questions about method. In particular, could you expand a little bit on the shortcomings you see in the existing scholarship in terms of method and therefore conclusion. Learned opponent, uh, thank you for the question. I appreciate that. Um, as I sought to uh, describe throughout, uh, especially in the beginning of the dissertation, uh, so much of John Owen research is, emphasis, uh, is emphasized uh, purely on theology. Uh, purely on just reading him in isolation to uh, the various uh, events that he was experiencing, whether as a pastor, uh, whether as a, uh, as a, as a traveling preacher uh, with the army, uh, whether as a uh, uh, political advisor and so forth, um, and just a general wider uh, cultural context. Um, and so, you know, several of the, uh, you know, more recent uh, secondary writings are, are helping us uh, in a tremendous way uh, to think uh, of Owen contextually, to put him in that context, uh, and not just to, uh, to, to read him, you know, in terms of, you know, what do he say about worship, and then just extrapolate that and say, um, as I tried to uh, point out, um, Owen believed in the so-called regular principle, because he talks about uh, worship according to scripture. Well, yes, he did, uh, but why? And uh, all these political uh, you know, eschatological, uh, cultural things, uh, just really important for, for us, I believe, uh, to put them in context and to bring out more of what he's saying. I, I asked the question partly because in your opening presentation, you used the word center. You, you were trying to find a center in Owen's theology. And of course, that can be quite a problematic approach to historical theology, can't it? Reductive and perhaps eliminating nuance and complexity. But there might also be a strength in the older scholarship and a strength in searching for a centre. Is that something you would choose to defend? 
I understand uh, the question and um, certainly uh, the research uh, seeking to get away from central dogmas. Um, for me, the, the imagery of center and sort of branching out is more of a, uh, more of an illust illustrative way of describing, you know, what's, what's going through uh, Owen's mind and his writings, uh, what's coming out in terms of uh, this idea of worship as public fellowship, communion with God. Uh, and it seems like we see that uh, throughout his writings uh, and then expanding or extrapolating out from that. Uh, so certainly uh, wouldn't call it a central dogma, but uh, definitely has uh, some strength in terms of uh, giving us a, a, a simple way of, of describing what is going on uh, with, his, with his theology of worship. I'd like to push back a little bit, esteemed candidate, on this idea that contextual readings of Owen can help us uh, gain new insights. What, what do we learn from the newer scholarship about Owen that we could not have known from the older method? In other words, is there any real added value to the newer contextual way of approaching Owen studies? Again, a uh, very good question. Um, it would seem to me that uh, older writings, uh, older scholarship of the period of uh, English Christianity, uh, it's either history or it's either theology. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking of particular names and particular sorts of books that, are, that have been published. Um, there is, of course, the danger of, uh, you know, overly psychologizing, um, you know, putting everything into context as if it was a direct, uh, a direct link, uh, a direct uh, result. But it seems like it helps us uh, to, to put things into the better context of, of the, the historical, you know, realities of the day. Uh, he's, a, he's a human being, and uh, he doesn't just write uh, in an ivory tower. He doesn't just sit there and write these books and uh, passes them down to us to, uh, for devotional reading. They're, they're you know, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, his, his, his treatise on temptation. Um, you know, typically it's reproduced in modern, you know, in our, in our time uh, as a book on helping people, Christians who struggle with, with uh, sinful temptations. Uh, but it helps us to see a little bit more of the color of what's going on when, when you realize the temptations that he's dealing with uh, in terms of political parties, um, in terms of policies, uh, the vision that he had uh, for for that congregational party, uh, part, the, the congregational way. So uh, the, the historical context definitely helps us with bringing more added color uh, and more uh, more uh, interesting uh, insights into you know what he said and why. Thank you, esteemed candidate. Can I? ask you then to take that general observation about the new approach to own studies and to apply it to your own work in this thesis and perhaps to help us understand a bit more what this contextual method this contextual approach adds to your work so that um, and what's the added value in knowing your work for someone working uh, in this field thank you That was a general, ob general observation, correct? <laughs> it sounded like a question. Oh, it sounded to me like a general uh, taking back, you know. At least take it an opportunity to respond. So, sorry, let, 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 let me clarify that if perhaps the, the signal was broken. Um, esteemed candidate, I was asking you to take the general observation you made about the newer criticism of Owen or the, the newer work on Owen, and then to tell us how your use of that newer approach, the contextual approach, has allowed you to draw conclusions you might not otherwise have been able to draw. Oh, okay, okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, well, just like I said, Owen was a was a human being, and he's a man. Um, as much as you know, I would like to just write pure historical theology. I'm also a human being, um, and the things that he said, uh, and as I read, um, you know, uh, contemporary scholarship on on you know reappropriating and re reassessing, um, you know, this issue of worship, you know, hits home for me. Um, as, a, as a pastor and um, as a Christian, as a father uh, who seeks to lead 
uh, his own family uh, in what worship is. Um, and so uh, that contextual approach in terms of my thesis, again, brings out more than just, you know, Owen was a Puritan. Um, that's, you know, speaking as a, as a, as a just, my own personal observation, that's how he's used, at least in the States. Um, you know, he believed in a certain view of strictness of worship. And, you know, if we would just get back to that. And I, and I think the contextual uh, approach, the value it brings to us is to say, there's always more going on. There's always, there are, there's always more uh, nuance. Um, we can't just pigeonhole people uh, into a box. Um, and so, you know, as a pastor reading his writings on worship, um, trying to be scholarly as well at the same time, uh, helps us to put him in, to, to put the humanity uh, into his writing and into his views, um, you know, whether we agree with it or not. And so, um, yeah, I guess, you know, that, that's my general observation. And, uh, you know, yeah, and seeking to continue to, uh, to sort of sift, you know, not just Owen, but any historical writing, sift it for the value, uh, you know, in its own context. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will then continue with the second opponent, which is Dr. Whitney Gamble, also present online. She's an independent researcher in Puritan studies. We are very happy to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I would like to begin by congratulating you, Mr. Hyde, for your work, and thank all of those who are involved in inviting me to participate in this momentous occasion today. I'm very happy to be here. But on the authority of the rector and by virtue of my right, I would like to discuss some points with you, esteemed candidate. My opposition picks up on Professor Gribben's question regarding method. It prim primarily focuses on the overarching argument that you are proving. So as stated in your introduction, you set out to, quote, investigate and analyze how Owen's eschatological vision explicitly impacted key topics of his theology. That's on Roman numeral page 11. This was an intriguing thesis statement and I was particularly struck by the word impacted. You used the word impacted again on pages seven and 14 to describe Owen's eschatological vision in relation to his theology. I wonder if you might briefly explain the explicit impact of Owen's eschatological vision on his theology for us. Uh, learned opponent, thank you again. Uh, good to see a fellow Californian. And um, uh, as far as the, the language of impact and uh, the impact of his uh, eschatology, um, as I tried to simply describe here in the first 10 minutes or so, um, just to pick up one example. So his view of, of uh, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's work uh, in prayer. Um, as a Puritan, um, you know, that can have many different uh, uh, meanings. But his view of prayer um, seems that uh, as he makes this shift in his, uh, his understanding of what's happening uh, in human history and what the Lord is doing, uh, as he as he begins to uh, see that as uh, as a future, uh, as an age that is now moving towards a, a future uh, uh, age, his view of prayer uh, seems to uh, be impacted uh, by eschatology because he sees that age to come in which there uh, there would be no need uh, for things like prayer books. Uh, the the individual minister uh, directly. Um, directly uh, impacted by, uh, by the Spirit, uh, uh, gifted by the Spirit, uh, and that the age to come. Uh, I, I quoted that, uh, that there's a quote he, he gives from Zechariah 12, when he's commenting on Zechariah 12, 10, uh, where he says, these are the times uh, wherein the Spirit of grace and of supplications, that language in the prophet, uh, is promised to be poured out upon the Jerusalem of God. And so this vision of uh, not just the commonwealth as a commonwealth, but uh, it's uh, being a means through which uh, the Lord is going to uh, spread the gospel, uh, the minister who's gifted uh, with that uh, immediate power of prayer, uh, that's 
because of what he what he sees as this age to come, an age of purity, an age of stripping away all the all the rites and ceremonies, uh, even within the uh, the godly uh, uh, party, uh, to see that that uh, uh, that age to come uh, as beginning already now. And I tried to make a little bit of uh, a nuance in that language of eschatology or eschatological. Uh, sometimes he speaks of it, uh, you know, of of accomplished things, eternal things that are impacting now, and other times, what I'm trying to focus more on is uh, that, that age to come. Thank you. Thank you for that response. I, I, I want to focus on, on that a little bit more um, closely with, with my second question. Um, so when I was, was reading through your summary of the thesis on pages 20 and 21, it was hard for me at times to see the relationship between eschatology, his eschatological vision, which that was a helpful summary of it, and the topics that you explore in each chapter. So for instance, you lay out the questions that each chapter focuses on. For instance, uh, for chapter three, how did Owen relate his doctrine of God's sufficient revelation to public worship? For chapter four, how did Owen understand the relationship of the old covenant to the new? And when I read these questions, it's, it wasn't immediately apparent that these questions address specifically how Owen's vision, eschatological vision, specifically impacted his theology. And I think in historical theology in our field, the word impact is quite a strong word. So it's actually rather difficult at times to prove impact or causation because we must find traces of something specifically in the text where the author is, is, is almost explicitly linking two things together in order for us as historians to say, yes, there is impact. So I wonder if you might speak to that a little bit. Um, and, and related to that, it's kind of a two-part question. Owen wasn't unique in his eschatological vision of, of the times that they were in. Um, many other Puritans also expressed similar ideas of, of eschatology and, and related them to their theology. So I wonder what makes Owen unique um, to have this eschatological vision. And I wonder if you might speak a little bit more to, I guess, the proof of, his, of the, that vision actually impacting these specific topics that you covered. So impact and uh, uniqueness is what I what I heard. Um, I appreciate the question questions. Um, yeah. So uh, language of impact. Um, trying trying to uh, uh, delve into historical theological uh, issues, um, but also receiving feedback, trying to push me to, towards more um, theological um, uh, uh, emphases or uh, applications, you know, even more contemporary ones. So trying to balance those things in terms of feedback that I received, which I appreciate all that. Um, so yeah, as far as impact, maybe perhaps um, seeking for a better way to describe um, that, uh, not saying necessarily one-to-one -one causation, um, but seeing a, a broader picture um, of his his view and, and yes, uh, others as well, the, the congregational way, the party, um, to see how their vision of what's going to happen um, is affecting, uh, perhaps affecting um, what they're saying. And so um, I, I don't know if I claimed that he was unique. Um, I certainly have a desire in the future to push out from Owen to others and to, and to see, uh, is this something that's uh, uh, is it just a, a, a congregational emphasis? You know, are there uh, other amongst the Puritan party, Presbyterians, uh, uh, non-conforming uh, uh, Anglicans or Episcopalians? Uh, are there uh, others who would uh, uh, say similar things? Uh, I'm not. I'm not able at this moment to answer. Uh, you know, with any any sense of definitiveness, other than to say uh, that I want to see something of the the uh, the affecting uh, vision. Uh, that he had, especially, uh, and try to try to show that um, 
you know, in, in these various topics. So, you know, as I try to summarize here uh, in those first 10 minutes in terms of, you know, his view of worship, uh, scripture, um, you know, before he, before his sort of shift in uh, eschatology, he says similar things um, in, his, in his catechisms about the role of scripture in worship, very narrowly focused upon the strictness of following what God commands, uh, but then showing how that same statement um, seemingly has more, you know, is this a technical theological term and so some, some oomph behind it, right? Some, there, there's, something, uh, there's something else going on about why he says we need to be very strict. And so uh, he's describing this, this issue of, you know, regulative principle uh, anachronistically uh, to, to, to say this is a, a mark of the godly uh, as they're moving towards uh, this this goal to come of this age uh, on earth. So something of the impact or the effectiveness, I guess, um, and uh, not necessarily saying that there's anything unique in Owen, but trying to focus as much as I could on on one uh, on one uh, writer. So. For time reasons, we might have to continue. Thank you, Dr. Gamble. Thank you very much. Opposition will be furthered by Professor Martin Kater, Professor of Practical Theology and Incoming Rector at the Theological University in Apeldoorn. We are honored by your presence. Thank you. Um, dear candidate, first of all, I would like to congratulate you with achieving this result for this instructive and well-structured study um, you put on the table. On the authority of the rector and by virtue of my right, of course, I would in being involved in this discussion. Uh, and first of all, um, you want to avoid, as I understand rightly, the godly hero paradigm. And therefore, you use the contextual method. But however, it seems to me, nevertheless, he is your great hero. Because I do not read any critical conversation on, for example, his use of eschatological. And so I would like to elaborate a little bit more on the former proposition. Uh, and that's on page seven. Um, let me start there. Um, you mentioned on page seven, um, a brief orientation that will follow. In two ways, he spoke of eschatologically. Um, and then you mentioned, on the one hand, um, this aspect of eschatology affects worship now. But Owen spoke eschatologically in a second way that is even more important for this dissertation. And then uh, is mentioned the coming age of the latter day glory. Um, so uh, I would like to ask you um, this distinction, isn't it a kind of great tension in the work of John Owen? I didn't read anything about that, but would you like to explain a little bit more on this distinction? And your conviction is that the, um, how do you call that? Uh, the second way is even more important. But I doubt if it is even more important. But that will be the next question. First of all, um, isn't it a great tension between those two ways of speaking about eschatology? Right? Learned opponent, again, thank you for the, uh, for the question. Um, as to the hero, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the very beginning, uh, I, th I believe it was a little sort of preface. Um, yes, I, I have read Owen for quite a while, um, but uh, I would also point out my, uh, my, my chapter in the, in the Brill volume, uh, edited by Professor Dr. Van Vlastein, um, seeking to be critical of, of Owen um, in his understanding of uh, in his exegesis of certain passages, do those, does his exegesis prove his point um, of this immediacy? Um, so I would, I would point to that. Um, as far as this uh, tension, 
I'm not quite understanding the question. Perhaps you can, the distinction between the two uses? Yes, you... right. There's on the one hand, uh, eschatological means more or less pneumatological in the here and now. Mm -hmm. okay. And you uh, state that for Owen, the second meaning is more important, the latter day glory. I think I was trying to say uh, more important uh, for my purpose, for my dissertation, this is the emphasis that I'm going to focus on, is this latter-day glory emphasis, not the emphasis of pneumatological nowness. So, mm -hmm. I understand, but however, on page 181, uh, paragraph 5.3.2, entering the heavenly sanctuary, um, I read the first sentence, Owen went on to address the question of how a believer enters heaven to worship the triune God. His answer was that believers enter heaven to worship by means of faith in Christ alone. Where is the eschatological meaning of the latter day's glory? This is about pneumatology. This, so I would like to conclude um, that what you state on page seven, in the second way is even more important. Um, that seems to me a little bit strange compared with what you state on uh, this page entering the heavenly sanctuary, isn't it? So I, um, my answer would be, um, tentatively my answer would be, based on, on, on other, uh, on other contemporary uh, Owen research, doctoral research, trying to give a broader perspective on, so mentioning things like that, just as a broader point to fill in more than just the narrowness. So um, perhaps that's a weakness is not focus on the narrowness, um, but I would just try to point out that uh, seeking to be uh, faithful just to, to allow him to speak. Yes, he says this, but, um, for my purpose, you know, I'm, I'm trying to focus on, on that other issue, but I don't want to leave that out. I, want, I wanted to give a, let him speak for himself. Yes, right. Thank you very much. But you use the contextual method. And now you are referring to uh, my purpose. Um, uh, would you like to uh, elaborate more on about that? For your purpose, the second meaning of eschatological is more important, but is it really the case in the theology of Owen himself? So, uh, yeah, my, my purpose, you know, in this dissertation, seeking to uh, do a work of historical theology, uh, that's, that's all that it meant. That, that's all that I mean by my purpose. There's nothing to be implied by that other than seeking to uh, explain Owen on his own terms as best I humanly possibly could. Thank you. Um, I will try to take another way. Uh, and I would like to start in your conclusion paragraph. Um, you speak on page 249. Um, about in the midst of the page, his liturgical theology was that worship was a heavenly phenomenon, and this heavenliness was expressed in four topics of his theology. And then you mentioned um, the four portions of the former chapters you discussed. But um, again, when I read the first two topics, um, they refer to the second meaning of eschatologically, uh, uh, as you mentioned on page seven. But however, uh, the third and the fourth, when you are uh, speaking out on the New Covenant congregation, and the doctrine of person and work of the Holy Spirit to public worship, as far as I can see, he is using, and you are using, 
the first uh, meaning of eschatological, namely in a pneumatological sense. Could you explain that? Explain in particular the, the fourth the fourth point on the Holy Spirit? Yes, and um, to take it again, uh, you stated at the start uh, that the second meaning was even more important. And I do not see this in your conclusion because the first two topics are indeed about the latter day glory, but the third and the fourth are much more about the first meaning of eschatological. Okay. So, uh, for example, on uh, 250, um, recognizing what he does say about, you know, putting ourselves in that context, the work of the spirit in a minister at that time. Um, but then I say, as the spirit was waking up ministers, and he uses this very language himself, his eyes being opened, um, waking up ministers to his gifts and their need of reliance upon him and not ecclesiastical props the latter uh, the latter day glory was drawing ever close so um this idea of yes there is a nowness of the spirit mm -hmm. but that's that's all preparatory for this age to come okay i'm very stubborn but um uh, again page seven through how the chapters to follow this distinction will be highlighted in terms of its impact on Owen's contextual and philological view of worship. This distinction will be highlighted. Could you uh, illustrate this for me? On what pages, in what paragraphs, do you highlight this distinction? And your answer has to be brief, unfortunately. What was that? Your answer has to be brief, oh. unfortunately. In, in response, I, I would say, um, again, seeking, you know, th throughout, uh, throughout each chapter and on that fourth one in particular, the chapter on the Holy Spirit and prayer. Um, yes, there, he, 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 he speaks in both ways. Um, and I guess my, my answer would be, you know, the, the conclusion of seeking to draw that out. Um, I have to look it up. I don't know if that's taking too much time, but. I think don't bother about it. There will be a Brill edition uh, to fill it up. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Carter. Then we continue with Dr. Hans Berger. He's Associate Professor of Systematic Theology at the Theological University of Kampen Utrecht. The floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Dear candidates, on the authority of the rector and by virtue of my right, I would like to ask you two questions. But first, Thank you for your dissertation, congratulations. Your thesis helps to better understand Owen's liturgical views as a reaction to debates in this context. According to Owen, the sacrifice and intercession of Christ are decisive for the worship of the new covenant community. In the new covenant, freedom is important and thus Owen opposes Anglican ceremonialism and defends freedom from liturgical rules. And because the Holy Spirit guides the church in prayer, prayer has to be free. Less clear to me is the positive view Owen develops with regard to liturgy. Christ is in heaven, but we are on earth. What should we do when we worship in the liturgy? Owen's eschatology has theopolitical significance, you say, but how does this eschatology shape the public manifestation of the new covenant community? You may know that in contemporary debates on liturgy, we see a new longing for rituals, practices, embodiment, formation. What could Owen offer to these debates? Did Owen only contribute to the disappearance of rituals? Should we blame him for deconstructing a good liturgical theology, focusing too much on Christ in heaven and the immediate work of the Holy Spirit and leaving us with a formless liturgy, a liturgy with nothing more than words without any embodiment? Or could we use Owen's view, for example, of the Lord's Supper 
celebrated by visible saints to rediscover embodiment in Protestant and evangelical liturgy? Will Owens eschatology lead to a community that really embodies and manifests God's presence among us? I missed in your book two chapters, a more general chapter on Owen's positive view of liturgy and worship and the chapter on the Lord's Supper, celebrated by the community of visible saints. Especially the last chapter, I think, could have answered these questions concerning the liturgical shape of the new covenant community and concerning Owen's contribution to the history of, lit of liturgical theology. So to summarize, I have two questions. Where is that? Why is there not a chapter on the Lord's Supper? And maybe more important, does Owen's eschatological, eschatological view of liturgy result in a formless liturgy of nothing more than words, or could understanding his understanding of the Lord's Supper be used to develop an inspiring view of formative embodiment? Learned opponent. Uh... Wow, um, I actually have in my notes here from your original comments uh, that this is, uh, this is a, a, a desire uh, or uh, an issue for further uh, study, uh, research, writing uh, in a more positive way, not as a historical theological way, but in a more theological, practical theological way. Um, so why, why no, your first question I believe was why no chapter on the Lord's Supper? Um, and I tried to... Uh, make the case uh, towards the beginning that uh, Owen, uh, in his own writings, gives us the, the key topics um, that lead, uh, that, that give the trajectory for his future discussions of worship. Um, and so these, these four topics um, are early in his writings, his very early parish pastor uh, ministry, uh, and, they, and, they, and they seem to pop up again and again and again. Uh, throughout his, uh, uh, his shifts and turns in, in, in vision. So uh, why no chapter on the Lord's Supper? Uh, for that reason, uh, trying to uh, trace these, the, the, the themes that he brings up. Um, and like I said, um, your, uh, your original comments are here uh, for me to, to ponder uh, for further practical theological uh, discussion. Uh, and your second question again? Well, um, when we see Owen, uh, did he only deconstruct li good liturgical theology, or could his views of the Lord's Supper be used to, to develop a view of liturgical embodiment that's formative as well? I'm not sure, Owen. Uh, you... <laughs> would use a language of deconstruct. Um, of course not. I know what you're saying. Yes, I know what you're saying. <laughs> it's, again, I wrote that down. Uh, that's something that your, 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 your comments, your questions to me were, uh, I don't want to say they're outside the, well, they're, they're seeking to do a historical theological uh, uh, research. Uh, they're somewhat out of the orbit uh, of my, uh, of my, uh, Supposed expertise, uh, but um, it's interesting. His just speaking theologically, uh, even practically, um, his understanding of uh, what the congregation is. Um, I think I I did mention a little bit. I interact a little bit um, with uh, Sam Renahan, his doctoral thesis uh, on Owen where he tries to make the case that Owen's view of, uh, of the church being a gathered community of saints. Therefore, his view of infant baptism is you know, very inconsistent. I tried to show, yes, there, there, is, a, there is a tension there uh, in Owen, uh, seeking to uh, have, the, have the, the church as a community of actual believers, professing believers, godly believers, uh, and that you know, leading to a, a what, what we would call, you know, a very closed communion table, right, uh, in, our, in our sort of ecclesiastical context. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there is a lot there in terms of uh, his understanding of, of presence of Christ uh, in Holy Communion, in uh, or you know, through Holy Communion. Um, 
So I, I guess I'm trying to say that there's a lot uh, to think about uh, in your questions um, that I'm not 100% uh, uh, comfortable explaining yet in terms of historical theology, but uh, just as theology and practice, uh, yes. There's a lot there for me, for me to, to go back and, and continue to write in a more practical theological volume. Okay, but, but if I were uh, living in Owen's times and I was inspired by his views and I went to him and I, I said to him, well, I want, to, I, want to I want to know how to lead a worship service. And he would say, well, Christ is in heaven, so that's most important. Then I know not what to do. Um, when he would say, well, don't use the, the rituals of the England church, just wait for the spirit, then I don't know what to do. Just wait for the spirit. Um, when... Um, we're talking about we're living in a new covenant, and that means that you're free, you're free from rules, but to do what? So what would he teach me positively okay. to, to be a good worship leader? So when he does talk about the elements of worship, it's always, it's always word. So we would understand to be reading and preaching of word, right, of the word, um, uh, singing, and he, he, makes, uh, he makes a point of singing psalms uh and administering the ordinances the, the 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 two sacraments and he says of those three elements you know in all these three with prayer so prayer is kind of the all-encompassing it has to uh uh you know infiltrate you know all three of those things it has to be saturated by prayer so and the, again this is i'm i'll speak this is where i'm not in agreement with owen uh, on these things um, I do think there is something of, uh, even in his own, I, I, I think he even recognizes something um, because he says on the one hand, uh, no forms of prayer, Book of Common Prayer, right? Uh, and ministers who rely on those are basically rely on crutches. But then he says, well, if ministers have, you know, deficiencies, then I'll allow it as long as you don't make me do it. That's sort of the, the back and forth that it feels like when you read, read Owen. Um, that there is this freedom, spontaneity, you know, spirituality, um, immediacy. On the other hand, we're human beings. We have to, there has to be some order, some structure. He gives the basic bare bones elements, uh, but I don't think he ever says, here's how, here's why. It's somewhat, as one who enjoys research on liturgy, it's somewhat nebulous to me. Okay, so th th does that mean that it's only verbal and that he leaves us with nothing than words? Verbal in terms of the, the do you mean the, the worship, like what is going on? It is just, just words. Very high, yes, very high Not view of words. Disembodied. Yeah, very high view of words, I would say. You know, the, the word, right? Thank it, you. Yep. We will now move to Professor Miriam van Veen. She's Professor of Church History at our faculty. Uh, dear candidate, first of all, congratulations with uh, the accomplishment of your book. You wrote on an important period of the English church history and cast new light on it. So congratulations and thanks for that. On the authority of the rector and by virtue of my right, I would like to ask you a few questions on your book. In your acknowledgments, you start with a very clear statement on your own faith and your own religious commitment. Um, it even raised the question how you think of the Catholic Church, but I trust you don't mean it to me. But my question is, how does this commitment, this religious commitment influence your own work? You seem to have a very clear ideas. For example, on page 29, you write, in August 30, 3033, Lord became Archbishop of Canterbury and began exerting even more ceremonialism in, on the church as well as the universities. And the second example, on page 51, you write, as a member of the international reformed Orthodox movement, Owen was conversant with the best of that tradition. So you seem to have very clear ideas, but you don't elaborate on that in your book or on the influence of your own position 
on your own research. And I would like to invite you to explain a little bit more about your own religious commitment and the impact of that commitment on your own book. Or to put it in, honor, in another way, suppose you were a supporter of the English high church tradition. How would you then write your book and how would that alter your work? Learned opponent, uh, I, I appreciate your comments and your, your, your question. Again, um, as best as humanly possible, seeking to do a, a work of historical theology, which I was trained, uh, which is uh, descriptive, not prescriptive. Um, we're all human beings. And so uh, obviously our, our biases come out um, in our own, our own understanding, but seeking to do a work of historical theology. Um, so, you know, the, the comment about Archbishop Laud, um, that's sort of a summary statement of, you know, many of the, uh, of the, of the sources and many of the secondary, um, you know, research uh, that has been done on that time. Um, so just to say, to say that, and then you mentioned on page 51, mm -hmm. uh, again, you know, that's, this is a, a comment of, uh, describing various men, uh, such as Sebastian Renman and others who have commented on his, uh, on Owen's understanding of uh, medieval Christianity and his, uh, his, his conversation partners there uh, in, in their books. Um, so that's the first part. Uh, my own personal religious commitment is, uh, and I'll state that with 100% certainty that Jesus Christ is my only comfort in life and in death. Uh, as the Heidelberg Catechism tells us in question and answer number one, uh, I am a, I'm a minister in a Dutch Reformed denomination in America. Uh, I subscribe to Three Forms Unity, uh, quia, because they agree with the scriptures. Um, and so uh, does that impact research? Sure. Um, we're humans. Uh, my own personal understanding and my own personal uh, uh, leanings, uh, my own congregation's practice of worship, we use the Book of Common Prayer <laughs> in our congregation. We use the Book of Common Prayer. Um, I'm a, I, I still, as, a, as an Orthodox Calvinist uh, who uh, practices, uses the Book of Common Prayer uh, in private and in public, uh, am still very, uh, <clears throat> very much uh, a, a charismatic, a Pentecostal at heart. So although uh, I'm no longer in that ecclesiastical tradition, uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit is within me and uh, he'll never leave me and uh, nor forsake me. So, um, but in but terms of you know, in research- fact, in, yeah. in fact, to be honest, you don't answer my question. You explain your own commitment, which is interesting enough, of course, but how does that affect your work? And once again, suppose, uh, you were uh, a member of a high church movement. How would that change your perspective? Well, um, as I mentioned, one of the earlier questions, you know, I do have a desire to, uh, to, uh, to read uh, in this period more of uh, the conforming Puritans, uh, those who uh, we're within the, uh, the structure of the Church of England, the Anglican Church, as, as, as it was, uh, be, became known, um, to see how they uh, navigate these things. Um, yeah, they're, they're of immense interest to me personally, my own personal you know, spiritual journey, my own, my own theological commitments. Um, you know, how, 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 how am I shaped? I, you know, I read Owen. I'm not convinced personally of his exegesis. Uh, on, on things like uh, the immediacy of the spirit in prayer to, in, you know, to, to move us. But on the other hand, I think there's a lack within uh, my own tradition of reformed churches in the United States uh, of, uh, of, I wouldn't call it ceremonialism, but formalism, just uh, uh, going through the motions without understanding. And so um, all research, of course, is going to shape you, whether it's just, you know, whether it's intellectual or spiritual or uh, with your own life, whether you agree or disagree uh, with the, the, the subject that you study. Um, I think it's, uh, I've, I view John Owen as a, as a conversation partner, and I have since I was 18 years old. Uh, 
I'm still struggling to understand how this commitment influences your, your work. So let's make it even more concrete. So if you were a member of that high church movement, how would you then write that paragraph on William Lord? Well, I would say again, that that's a general statement that uh, can be found in, in histories uh, of, of the time. Uh, uh, hit research describing the history of that time that this is one of the issues that uh, that people had was that there was more more things such as uh, you know requiring to be to bow at the name of Jesus and so forth. This is just a description of what of his impact in that time. I, I don't think if you were a high, if you were a high church or a low church or however you describe that, um, I, I don't think that's a controversial statement. Okay, uh, let me turn to a second uh, question on John Calvin. Uh, in the chapter on John Calvin, you try to refute Gore and Packer, and uh, they see a discontinuity between Calvin and Owen. You try to refute them, uh, and you make a statement about continuity. But my question is, was there really Continuity, but because in Wesel and Frankfurt, Calvin urged his followers to accommodate to the given liturgical settings and to negotiate with those liturgical settings. So Calvin seems to have been willing to accommodate instead of insisting on pure uh, reformed liturgical settings. Can you clear, specify the question exactly again? I didn't quite hear the question. That was a discussion with the reformed refugees in Wesel and Frankfurt. And Calvin urged them to accommodate to the given settings. And when Frankfurt City Council decided to, church, to close that church because they refused to accommodate, Calvin blamed the reformed for not accommodating to the liturgical settings and thought that the city council was entirely right in closing that church. So Calvin uh, seems to have been very ready to negotiate on the liturgical settings and to count with the so-called adiaphora. Now that my defense has ended, I sincerely thank the opponents for the attention they have devoted to my thesis. And I look forward to the decision of the doctoral examination committee in the Faculty of Religion and Theology, which will decide whether the degree of doctor of philosophy will be granted to me. I hereby adjourn the public meeting of the doctoral examination committee of the Faculty of Theology and Religion for further deliberations.
please be seated. I reopen this public session. By its duly accorded authority, the Doctoral Examination Committee of the Faculty of Religion and Theology grants the degree of Doctor of Philosophy to Daniel Robert Hyde. Professor Wim Vlasstein, appointed by the College of Deans as supervisor, will perform the investiture. I first invite the supervisors to place their signature to the degree certificate as witness of this deed. I declare in public that in the privacy of the closed session, the candidate, in accordance with the doctoral regulation of this university, has promised to preserve at all times the norms of scientific integrity as laid down in the Netherlands Code of Conduct for scientific practice. I now request colleague Wim van Vlasten to resume the ceremony. Only the doctoral examination committee will stand during the pronouncement of the investiture formula. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the statute of the Vrije Universiteit and as a supervisor appointed thereto by the College of Deans, I hereby confer on you, Daniel Robert Hyde, the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, together with all rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereto appertaining. In witness thereof, the seal of the university and the signatures of the rector and the supervisors have been affixed to the diploma you are about to receive. The laudation will be given also by Professor Van Vlastein. Dr. Hyde. Dear Danny, it's a great honor for me to be the first to congratulate you on the completion of your doctoral degree. It has been more than nine years since we first came in contact with each other. You sought contact by email to research Owen's theology and spirituality from the perspective of his liturgy. We did not know each other, but a common recognition in John Owen's work, the research team you proposed, and your passion for academic reflection on the spiritual reality of worship led to our cooperation. You have taken up your research topic with great diligence. As far as, far as I recall, the design of your proposal did not present any major problems. It's very common to get feedback to sharpen the research question. Thus you arrived at the Toro design of, for your study and set to work. You wrote chapter after chapter. We have produced a beautiful result. As supervisors, we could accept the main direction of your research, but we insisted on greater depth and deeper analysis. You took the, these suggestions well and incorporated this approach in your thesis. Your research makes a substantial contribution towards understanding the theology of John Owen. You have demonstrated that worship was a central matter for him. In addition to the existing research, you have also shown that various facets of his theology are related to and determined by his understanding of worship. This includes his view of scripture, his approach to the difference between Old and New Testaments, his understanding of the heavenly priesthood of Jesus Christ, and the gift of prayer by the Holy Spirit. You have also shown that his theological view of worship is determined by the historical context and as a political eschatological character. These insights in your thesis not only contribute to a better historical understanding of John Owen's theology, but they also assist us in thinking through theological questions today, especially ecclesiological issues. 
Now that we have traveled down this road, it's also time to look back. This special moment raises several questions in my mind. I have wondered how you have, how you were able to complete this study. First, you have a family. You and your wife, Cara Jean, have four children, Cyprian, Kaiden, Dexton, and Sadie. A growing family demands a lot of care. Second, you are a church planter. You founded the Oceanside United Reformed Church in 2000 in California. This is a pioneering work in which you constantly face fresh challenges that require considerable attention. Furthermore, the churches you originated from were non-denominational and charismatic or Pentecostal. Well, you have been drawn towards historic expressions of Protestantism. Also, this process of considering and reconsidering requires much energy. Fourth, it has not escaped our notice that you have been tremendously productive. You have written 20 books, at least, and even more artic articles on worship, ch church unity, the work of the Holy Spirit, church planting, and the Reformed Confession. You must have great energy, strong discipline to work, and a clear mind to keep track. It's not natural to have these gifts. As a writer on the gifts of the spirit, you are more aware than anyone else that you were given this grace to combine this work with your studies. Speaking about the spirit leads me to another matter that has drawn my attention, namely your relationship with John Owen. You were brought up by an unbelieving father and a nominal Roman Catholic mother. In this church you were baptized these biographical facts do not suggest that anyone should have a relationship with John Owen, the Puritan giant who studied worship and placed his spiritual understanding of worship in opposition to the emphasis on extern external finery in the Roman Catholic tradition. You came to personal faith in a four square church at the age of, age of 17 and attended an Assemblies of God College where you were impressed spiritually by Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, and Judaism. In addition, you had your prejudices against Calvinism as the frozen chosen. How can it be that someone with such a background ends up in fellowship with John Owen? Behind this great mystery, you will confess the leading of the spirit. Humanly, humanly speaking, I think that your interest in worship and spiritual liberty is rooted precisely in your own personal background. Seen this way, your research has also has also has everything to do with yourself and the healthy reflection on your own theology and spirituality. That is what we advocate here at the Vrije Universiteit. Academic reflection on our own perspectives. Therefore, we are proud that you have conducted your research at our university. We congratulate you wholeheartedly on the result in which we include also your family. And we look forward to further results from you as a passionate pastor academic. God bless you. To the congratulations of your supervisor, I gladly add the felicitations of the Council of Deans of the University. This doctoral examination ceremony is now completed. Dr. Hyde will now lead the procession out of this hall, and I invite you to follow. By pronouncing the doxology, I would like to close this public session of the Doctoral Examination Committee of the Faculty of Religion and Theology. Please stand. The name of the Lord be praised to all eternity. <laughs>